Hi, I'm Phil Myman. Welcome to this edition of Hard Fire. I'm the former Libertarian congressional candidate from Connecticut, the home of the infamous Kilo versus New London decision about eminent domain abuse. Joining us today is Daniel Goldstein, who is intimately involved with fighting eminent domain abuse right here in Brooklyn in the infamous Atlantic Yards project. Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Daniel, why don't you tell us a bit about the project itself? Uh, what's the history? What's the, what's the situation? Well, uh, we reached a key moment in the, the project just yesterday. Um, the project was unveiled in December 2003, three years later after it went through a, a sham political process. Uh, the state's public authorities control board, which is comprised of or controlled by Speaker Sheldon Silver, Majority Leader Bruno, and Governor Pataki voted unanimously to approve the project. So the political process for the, this project, which is $4 billion, um, 16 skyscrapers, and a basketball arena, uh, received its political approval. Uh, no legislative body voted on it or even held hearings on it. So in a way where uh, the people fighting this are quite pleased, partly because we no longer have to deal with what was a fixed uh, political process uh, from day one. So the vote yesterday was not much of a surprise at all. And what that means is the fate of this project, as we have always felt and, and, and knew, uh, it will be decided by uh, some judges or a judge, uh, particularly in a federal lawsuit that 10 plaintiffs have brought in the Eastern District in Brooklyn, uh, challenging the constitutionality of the use of eminent domain to construct this project. So the eminent domain, how did you first hear about, did, who, did so, the government approach you and say we want to take your where you live, or how did, what was your first involvement? Uh, the government actually has never approached any of the people living or working or owning uh, in the proposed project site. Um, first I heard of it was through uh, uh, a local activist and newspaper reports um, about Bruce Ratner looking to buy the nets, and pretty soon after that it became clear that uh, the area that he wanted to bring the nets to and build the massive uh, development project. and when the boundaries of that site were drawn, it included uh, my home, the block I live on, as well as uh, about three and a half other blocks, which at the time were uh, inhabited by people. Um, the other part of the pro project site is about, the 40% of it is comprised of uh, rail yards owned and uh, uh, maintained by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA. Um, so pretty soon after it was announced, people started uh, worrying what, what, what to do. Uh, it looked like the government was intending to take these properties at Bruce Ratner's request and give them to him to demolish and build this, this massive project. But presumably they would pay something. Uh, well, the Constitution says in the Fifth Amendment that uh, government uh, can take private property for a public use, public use right. with just compensation. Um, the, one question is what's just in a situation like that? Um, also, have you, what, have you received offers or have other people received offers? What's that been like? Uh, many people over the past three years, through the threat of eminent domain hanging over them, mm -hmm. have been made offers by the developer. By Ratner um, directly or, mm -hmm. or his people? <coughs> no, excuse me, no government involvement in those, in those offers. Basically, uh, there was no government involved over those three years when it came to these properties. It was Ratner either approaching you and mm -hmm. negotiating uh, from my point of view, in bad faith, because always behind him was the state. Right. And uh, he would basically, his company would say, um, here's an offer, and it may even be a, a, a decent money offer, but if you don't like it, uh, well, the state will take the property from you. So many people took that offer. Um, I don't blame them. The stress, the, the uncertainty of eminent domain hanging over you um, is not something that people want to deal with. and. Uh, Fortunately, there are many people who have stuck it out um, because they want to stay in their homes. Additionally, there are many tenants, uh, renters living in the footprint. No offers are made to tenants, real, no real offers, no meaningful offers. Right. So uh, in October of this past year, October 26th, uh, 10 plaintiffs, uh, owners, renters, and a business owner filed a, a lawsuit uh, charging that this is an unconstitutional use of eminent domain. So you're an owner. I own a, a condo in a building which um, is actually situated, uh, th this is today's uh, daily news headline, 
Uh, this is showing uh, that the project was approved by the state board. And where you see that arena, uh, my home is somewhere at so, center court, basically. Nice. Um, you can practice your free throws from there and right outside your window. So I live in a building uh, that is has been emptied out. Uh, Are you the last person in it? Yes, I live there with my my fiance and wow. um, and. Uh, is it for, how does it feel having your whole the whole building to yourself? <laughs> it's not ideal. It's not. It's <laughs> not it feel, what I bought into. Does it, right? Does it feel safe or does it feel scary? Have you gotten um, used to it? It, it, it? I've certainly gotten used to it. That's been the situation there's for, no for two nothing? years. There's no doorman, nothing? It was never a doorman building, so no, there's no doorman. Uh, it's, it's, well, it's secure. Um, it's not that comfortable uh, having uh, so many people know that, that I'm in that situation. I'm very public right. uh, in my uh, opposition to the project and, and the eminent domain. But there's domain. no vandalism or squatters or anything no, like that? No. Okay. In, in probably almost any other country, there would be squatters. Uh, the developer has been very... Um, uh, uh, focused, let's say, on making sure there aren't ah. uh, any any break-ins, uh, which I'm I'm thankful for that. Right. <laughs> um, but it's you know you have a building. That's that, from his point of view too. It's absolutely. Yeah. But supposedly this project is about providing so-called affordable housing to people because there's a housing crisis. Yet he has bought out and warehoused uh, hundreds of units of housing that have sat vac sat vacant for years. Let's go through some of the buildings in the neighborhood. You can tell us about them. Uh, well, this this building is Twenty uh, Fourth Sixth Avenue, which is actually uh, it's known as the Spalding Building uh, because uh, it was once the factory of the Spalding uh, Spalding Sporting Goods, where they made the famous pink Spalding ball. Not um, the basketballs. Was I'm not sure if they there? made basketballs there, but uh, that building is it's a gorgeous building that was uh, rehabilitated and turned into residential um, about four years before the project was announced. It was fully occupied, Oy. and that's been emptied out. Same with my building. It was a converted warehouse turned into condos, fully occupied in May of 2003. Oy. And uh, that, just that in itself, the idea that you're rehabbing and creating housing uh, through private interests. And there goes that investment. There goes Presumably that the investment was not made for a six-month period, right? No, no. <laughs> So, so that building now sits empty at the corner of Sixth Avenue, completely Avid empty, and uh, Pacific Street. Yes, completely empty. Okay. <laughs> uh, these are. This is uh, eight twelve Pacific Street, and as you can see, um, it's it's a very neighborhood uh, neighborhoody uh, location. Many of the people in that photo are are family members related to each other, and uh, that woman you see looking out the window, and and other people in that building are actually plaintiffs, they're rent-stabilized tenants, and they are plaintiffs on the lawsuit we filed. They still live there? They live there. Okay. Is it, uh, are they the only ones that live there? A lot of people have left? That, or? that building is full, and many of them, they're like a family. Oh, I see. Okay. And some are, are related, and, and they're okay. like a family, and most of them, they're all uh, uh, plaintiffs on this suit. Okay. Uh, this is a number of buildings. Uh, in the background there, you can see the, the top of the uh, Brooklyn's Williamsburg Savings Bank building. And then these these is these that in, included in the no, scope? No, okay. no. Um, the uh, the buildings you see there, uh, there are four buildings. Uh, that this white building, um, uh, the developer has bought. But the other two buildings or three buildings, uh, those are also homeowners who are plaintiffs uh, on this lawsuit. And uh, the full, full. Uh, the, the, the green building and the yellowish building are owned by an individual whose grandfather uh, bought them decades ago, lived in them. He died and left them to So to basically, him. from their point of view, there's almost no price at which they're willing to sell, right? There, obviously, uh, there's I'm, some price, but... I'm not going to speak for them um, uh, at all. Um, I think they believe what's going on uh, with this project and its, its abuse of eminent domain is simply wrong. Mm -hmm. And they, they bought these... Well, he was left. He lives there, right? And he wants to stay there, and uh, he certainly feels uh, that uh, it's not for uh, Bruce Ratner to ask Governor Pataki to take it and give it to Bruce Ratner. Reasonable? Seems reasonable. Uh, this is your building. building I live in, um, with uh, some close-ups of it. Um, it's actually a one-of-a-kind building. Uh, it's the only one by this particular architect in in the city, um, but. Uh, how does he feel about this? <laughs> He's long gone. Oh. But uh, you can, 
the, the justification in New York State and for this project uh, that you have to show, you have to show that a proposed site uh, for eminent domain is blighted. And in New York State, uh, blight means almost anything. For example, in this project, the state agency, the Empire State Development Corporation, uh, prepared a blight study uh, two years, more than two years, into uh, this pro the life of this project. So it was sort of a bootstrap uh, argument to, to claim that project site is blighted and therefore the, the public use is removing that blight. Well, you can see the buildings that we're looking at. And these are buildings that, uh, you know, some look beautiful, some look to some people maybe less than beautiful, but they're all fully functional, viable uh, buildings that people live in. Uh, so for, in their blight study, things like cracks in the sidewalk are signs of blight. Uh, vacancies are signs of blight. In this case, and this happens a lot, the developer with the threat of eminent domain empties out the buildings and then says they're vacant. And that's blight. Why is vacancy a sign of blight? It's, it, it's a good question. They're, basically, they're saying the area is not utilized, it's underutilized, and it's not bringing in enough tax revenue. Uh, underutilized in, in this blight study means that uh, a particular parcel is, is zoned, let's say, for a certain amount of density, uh, a floor area ratio. And if you're u only using, say, 60% of what you're allowed to build, that's underutilized and blighted, as if government is basically saying uh, you, you have to build right. to full density, otherwise uh, uh, you're right for the taking. Yeah. And if he builds his project, then it's going to be full capacity? Well, it's, it's It'll be, be blighted by his, by his own Well, some people argue that the project that is, uh, was approved yesterday itself uh, uh, could cause, cause blight. Um, so blight, is ba blight means nothing, basically. Well, it means nothing and everything in New York State. Basically, if, if government wants to use eminent domain, and in this case it was not government that suggested using it, it was a private developer, uh, they'll find a way to say an area is, is, uh, is blighted. Um, and uh, you, you asked, uh, well, would his, be, would his project be uh, blight? The, the, the biggest, or probably the biggest problem with this project is New York City has a, a, a very vibrant land use review procedure, a process you go through that's democratic, uh, multiple public hearings, uh, community board hearings, borough president hearings, and finally a hearing before the city council and the council, uh, if you can believe this, gets to vote on it. Well, that's all been bypassed. How do you uh, bypass something like that? Well, the, the, the state uh, has taken over the project. Uh, that's why it's in Albany. And, and the state has the authority um, to override the city charter and that land use uh, review procedure. Um, now, they claim because the rail yards are, are, are state-owned public land uh, that, that therefore the state, that, that's the justification for the state takeover. But the rail yards are less than half of the project, and they certainly could have run the rail yards uh, through a state process and the part that's not rail yard through a city process. But, mm -hmm. but they didn't do that. And, and the real reason is the state process is uh, there's very little transparency. There's um, very little room for public input or a vote. There's no vote. And it's not a, uh, it's not a planning process. It's basically an environmental review and environmental disclosure process as to the impacts that the project would, would uh, uh, incur. Okay, so that's, that's kind of two issues, right? One is the pure eminent domain issue. The other is the process and how they're circumventing various safeguards well, that probably the people have put into place. They're deeply related, um, and particularly for the lawsuit we brought. Um, how are they related? Well, you mentioned you uh, ran for office where you would have re represented uh, New London. Uh, Connecticut. Uh, it, it would not have been in my district, but yeah. Okay, but near yeah. that area. Yeah. Anyway, you're familiar with the key, Suzette Kilo right. and her, the other plaintiffs first, the city of New London. And the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the city, 5-4 um, split decision. And what Kilo was saying uh, to the Supreme Court was that economic development is not a public use. Um, there is a long history of public use being perverted to mean uh, public benefit otherwise known as economic development, mm -hmm. uh, meaning new tax revenue, basically, for right. a municipality. Um, so public use has been perverted. Um, anyway, they, the Kilo lost that case, and where the court basically said, well, economic development is a public use. But in, 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 
implicit in the majority opinion and explicit in a concurring opinion written by Justice Kennedy, who was the swing vote, he made the majority. Um, he outlined uh, an exception to, to the majority opinion, uh, and, and the exception was basically about the process by which the eminent domain is, is uh, undertaken, um, meaning um, there has to be a, a correct process, otherwise it would be a violation of the Constitution, according to Kennedy, and basically according to the majority. So he's opinion. focusing on the word just and just compensation. No, he's not talking about compensation at all. Uh, what, the what, process to get the comp that's no, not, not that. Compensation is not the issue. So here. the process of determining whether it's public use, that's the issue. No. What's, uh, which process? Well, is well that, the issue? Yeah, that is the question in the end. What what's a public use? But what Kennedy said is there are characteristics of a taking that uh, would show that it's basically a private taking. It's okay. primarily for right. the benefit of a private uh, entity. In this case, for a city Ratner. So New London, whether it was legitimate or not, the city of New London studied an area um, of New London and said it needed redevelopment and they condemned the properties with eminent domain and then put it out for bidding to, multi to all comers. Um, with Atlantic Yards, Far City Ratner came up with a plan that included the need of, for eminent domain to, to see that plan through, went to government and said, will you take these properties for us? Justice Kennedy also talked about the need for legislative, um, a legislative process, legislative planning process. And uh, the, 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 to put it very simple, Kennedy was basically saying, uh, Bruce Ratner cannot simply go to the governor and ask him to take property for him. And on top of that, um, the primary beneficiary of um, these takings is this developer. And clearly, um, Atlantic Yards an effort was made to make sure that this developer gets this project. So Justice Kennedy said that if the, if, the, uh, if the beneficiary of the takings is known before the takings, that raises suspicion about what's going on. Um, New London, it was unknown who would benefit. In Brooklyn, it was known three years ago that this corporation would benefit from the takings and that the, the public benefits are incidental to that private benefit. I see. And there's, there's ample evidence that this is a completely developer-driven, favored developer, favored developer process. And uh, we, we feel that, that, that we can certainly show that, and that it is a matter for the court to decide if, if that's what Kennedy was talking about, and we, and we believe that. Oh, after that decision was, was made, the Supreme Court, the Kelo decision, um, there was an eminent domain expert attorney, a professor at Columbia, who basically said if Atlantic Yards had been before the court, it would have gone the other way. Interesting. So public use in this situation um, comes down to the process whether, where it's determined, whether it, whether it passes a smell test, essentially, for being yeah, when, public use. When, when th there's too much room for corruption and favoritism, which in the end is about benefiting a particular en a entity at the expense of other individuals, there's too much room for that when it's a developer driving the process. Uh, for example, when the traditional public uses that people talk about with eminent domain are to build roads, highways, rail yards, ra railways, hospitals, parks, and so forth. And, uh, and w when you build a road, it's not speculative. When you build a road, the public use is a road, right? But when you build a, a commercial development, everything about it is speculative. The, re the return on investment for the public, the financial projections are speculative, the job creation is speculative, the amount of housing is speculative, and, and that's why that's not really a legitimate public use. Because what's not speculative is that the developer who gets the properties is going to benefit. Right. The public benefit is, uh, is, is completely speculative. So if he had done the process in a better We would have way. no case. If, if, if the city uh, looked at the area and said it's blighted and we, we want to create new tax revenue and so forth and we're going to put it out for bidding mm -hmm. and someone bid on it and they took the properties, we, we wouldn't have a case. And you think if it went through that process, it likely would not result in at least the current project as is. Yeah, would be I, think, different. I think if you had a legislative body, particularly a local one like the city council involved, uh, particularly post-Kilo, um, where, where governments are, are, are really careful, well, uh, scared basically of using condemnation. Um, there would have been give and take, 
and there would have been a discussion if this was the best thing to do. Now, um, it's likely they still would have approved this sort of thing. Uh, but when there's no legislative involvement, it's, it's the, de the developer has been the government for the past three years. Would you have still opposed it if it had gone through the local process on pure uh, eminent domain issues? That I, even though I believe I would have opposed it because it's clear to me that uh, these takings are for, this, for the developer's benefit. And besides that, the benefits discussed by the state and the city and, and Ratner um, many of them could, or most of them, could all be achieved without taking a single piece of property. There's an eight and a half, there's an eight and a half uh, acre rail yard there. That's a large piece of land that could be developed. And uh, the group that I work with, Develop Don't Destroy Brooklyn, believes that should be developed. Um, we've, Who we, owns that land? The MTA owns that land. And the MTA the state. Yes. And the MTA sold it, uh, although they haven't actually closed on that deal, but they sold it to the lower bidder. Bruce Ratner bid $50 million. Excel Development Company, uh, which proposed a plan that was in tune with a community-devised uh, plan, uh, bid $150 million to Ratner's $50 million. Ratner eventually upped the offer because they made him up it to $100 million, still less. The appraised value was $214 million. So that, that's... How can they sell it to a lower bidder? Well, we'll have to ask uh, Mr. Calico, who's the chairman. Uh, of the MTA, outgoing chairman, who actually right. said when asked, but there was one dissenting vote on the MTA board, uh, Mitch Pally, and he said, why are we selling this so bar far below the appraised value? And Calico said, um, I'm not going to be beholden to the appraised value. That's just some guy's idea of what they're worth. But as far as our case goes, that's, that's another sign that this is a, a fixed favored developer. There, so, and there are many signs of that. So you're kind of handicapped by the Kilo decision and yet you're left with the small the, uh, one area. Well, you quite frankly, if Kilo had, if the Supreme Court had ruled uh, in favor of Kilo, the property owners, yeah. um, saying that economic development uh, is not a uh, public use, um, I'm not sure that we would have a case because in New York State they claim the justification is blight. It's very hard, as, as absurd as the blight study is, it's very difficult in a court to argue, uh, to get a court to agree with the citizens that the state's finding of blight is, is wrong. Um, but what, so what's the, the philosophy behind blight? Getting rid of blight as a public use, is that the that's idea? Po that's, that's, that's the foundation justification, not just for the eminent domain, but for this whole project. Um, that re removing blight uh, is the government's public purpose here. And it's no matter how small or how big. So if you have a small blight in one absolutely. corner of your room. Ab well, you could have, uh, in this case, there are 73 parcels. And uh, you could have half of them fall under the government's blight characteristics spread throughout, let's say. Um, it doesn't matter if you have million dollar condos uh, mixed in. Um, in order to assemble the land, they call it all blighted and assemble the land. And actually, they, the, the, <laughs> the government claims that uh, another reason eminent domain is being used is because there are, another sign of blight is that there are too many owners making it difficult to assemble properties. Now, you, go to, you go to any block in New York City, you're going to have too many owners. But I thought that's uh, what, um, I thought that's what America was about, that uh, people strive to own a piece of property. But this is so unbelievable, right? How it's <laughs> It's so un-American. Well, it, it's, it's, uh, it's un-American, it's unethical, and it's simply wrong. And that's why I, I know that uh, personally and, and many other people feel just um, in their gut, this is wrong. And uh, I, you know, This isn't the first time, obviously, New York has used blight as an as No, they an use excuse. it all, all so, the time. And, and that's never gotten to the Supreme Court, the blight issue of what is blight or whether it, how, how it, well it defined ha it has to be? Well, well uh, I, I forget the year. Um, it was the the, uh, the Berman decision, I think. I may have that wrong by the Supreme Court. Uh, it was an area in D.C. where they said it was blighted, and that was challenged, and it's basically challenged by somebody who's saying, well, my property is not blighted. Maybe th these are, but, but mine's not. And they mm -hmm. basically said, well, we're, it's not for a, a court to decide or overrule the government to decide, well, what's blighted and what's not. But, um, as far as New York State's uh, blight laws being challenged. They have been challenged and, they, and, and no one has, has won to date. 
although all those challenges were prior to the Kelo decision, and now courts may, may look more closely. But Times Square was redeveloped uh, using blight as uh -huh. justification for eminent domain. Columbia University right now is poised to use eminent domain using blight as the justification. Willits Point in Queens uh, is, is to be determined blighted wow. to use eminent domain. And in New York State, you have to show it. And as long as courts are going to defer to the government agencies, uh, it's very tough to challenge that. Another, in, in the blight study here, they claim that in the project site, there's a much higher crime rate than the surrounding areas. Well, uh, <laughs> they actually fudge the numbers and statistics. And if you actually look at them, the crime rate is actually lower in the project site. So we, if, if, if we do challenge, we're in federal court. Right. There will also be a challenge by numerous community organizations um, to the state's environmental review process and its That's findings. The and that includes, research. that includes blight. Um, okay. But, but basically, the, how, when this project was announced three years ago at their big press conference, they never said, we're proposing this in order to remove blight. It was all about the hoopla over the nets <laughs> and, and housing and jobs and so forth. They didn't mention the word blight. It was only a year or more into this that uh, all of a sudden we started hearing th this blight. And then basically um, July of this past year, a blight study was put out. And all of a sudden, it's blighted. You had no idea you were living in such blight. No, no. And it, and it's, it is frightening uh, that basically any neighborhood could be determined blighted under, un, under New York State's laws, but, al but also if a project is truly good for the public, it should not matter um, if it's on Madison Avenue in Manhattan or uh, lower income neighborhoods, say, like East New York, Brooklyn. If it, it's illegitimate to, to yeah. use blight. And what happens is supposedly blight is to help the people living there. But what always happens is the blighted people are pushed out in order to put in uh, uh, something for, for newcomers that doesn't make sense. Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. Is there anything that viewers can do to help the cause to well, stop eminent domain? Yes, abuse? keep in mind that the state approved this project. Fortu fortunately, it'll be up to a judge if the project happens. Okay. Support us uh, with your uh, contributions. That's, that's how the public can help. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, join us again for another edition of Hard Fire. Thank you. <laughs>